we cannot live alone. It was not one stone or timber which made the fair temple a thing of beauty to be a joy forever. So it is here. As the nail is to the building or, or as the one spoke is to the wheel, so each one of us is a part of the framework of human society. For good or for ill, the life which begins in these schools will affect the lives of thousands of others. Chicago in the 1850s. A city on the rise, its population quadrupling across the decade, a boom buoyed by the massive expansion of canals and railroads into the Midwest. But this epic development had costs. With an increased population came increased demands on the land and on the city's infrastructure. Disease ravaged the ever-growing city in devastating waves. Some city engineers discovered their problem and they knew their solution. Chicago needed an entirely new sewage system. The challenge was that Chicago was built on the marshes of Lake Michigan, barely above water level. The experts figured out that in order to have proper sewage, the city of Chicago needed to exist about 14 feet higher in elevation. So they decided to hoist up Chicago by 14 feet. By 1857, the year our story begins, the raising of Chicago was underway. Trainloads of new residents took in their new neighborhoods, watching the teams of men using jack screws to lift whole buildings off the earth, elevating the city piece by piece. Piece by piece, the possibilities and dramas of this growing city brought thousands of people, many of them poor workers, especially immigrants from grieving Ireland. It also brought capitalists on the make, actors and actresses, bishops, lawyers, doctors. The raising of Chicago was the marker of a new era. It was a rebirth for the city and its residents. A young pastor we will come to know had to navigate dizzying streets and rising buildings as he cobbled together a parish. Our story begins here during one time of rebirth in Chicago. Hi, I'm Sam. This is my friend, Logan. We like sharing stories from local history, which is why we're excited to talk about a building in Faribault, Minnesota called Johnston Hall. Our telling of Johnston Hall's story begins with the 1857 birth of a woman named Clarina Shumway in the transforming Chicago we have just described. Her parents, Augusta and Horatio, were well-to-do travelers from New York, seeking opportunities in the Western city. Chicago would grow and prosper in the 19th century, the new family hoped to do the same. As did another New York transplant who found a home during the raising of Chicago, Henry Benjamin Whipple. In 1856, Henry Whipple arrived in Chicago. Whipple was an Episcopalian pastor from New York. He'd come with his wife Cornelia and their six children, asked to serve a new parish. The trouble was, the parish did not exist yet. 
Whipple had been invited to Chicago by a group of three Episcopalians, the bare minimum to start a new parish. And now it would be Whipple's job to build a congregation out of nothing. Whipple walked the chaotic streets, past the teens of men lifting buildings into the air. He stood in his non-existent parish's empty rented hall and probably thought back to what a mentor had cautioned him back in New York. Whipple was told by this bishop, you must not go. If you wanted to go west, why did you not accept a settled parish? If you go, you will starve. Whipple was determined to prove him wrong. At first, my parishioners were from the highways and hedges, and the support came from the free will offerings of the people. I visited every shop, saloon, and factory within a mile of the hall, leaving a card, giving the place an hour of worship, and stating that it would be at the service of anyone needing help, day or night. I called on the chief engineer of the Galena Railway to ask his advice as to the best way to reach the operatives, but there were hundreds of railway men in Chicago. He asked me, how much do you know about a steam engine? Well, nothing, I replied. Then he said, read Lardner's Railway Economy till you are able to ask an engineer a question about a locomotive and he not think you a fool. I followed his advice and in due season went to the roundhouse of the Galena Railway where I found a number of engineers standing by a locomotive which the firemen were cleaning. Observing that it was a Taunton engine with inside connections, I asked at a venture, which do you like better, inside or outside connections? Well, this was followed by questions about steam heaters and variable exhausts, and in less than half an hour, I was taught far more than I had learned from my book. In leaving, I, I said, boys, where do you go to church? I have a free church in Metropolitan Hall where I should be glad to see you, and if any time you have an accident or need me, I will gladly go to you. The following Sunday, every man was in church. Henry Whipple quickly built a following and a reputation in Chicago. He knew how to talk to people. Whipple made sure he knew when there were accidents at the rail yards, and there were many accidents, so he could provide comfort and aid whenever possible. Cornelia, his wife, would rush out of the house after the children were asleep to give out food to the laboring poor. Their church did not require paid dues for attendance, unlike many at the time. Whipple's church had no financial barrier to entry. It was on the strength of this reputation that Whipple made an impression on the Shumway family. Somehow though, Whipple's parish started out as a rented hall full of poor people from highways and hedges. A wealthy young couple found their way to his church. Augusta and Horatio Shumway learned about, met, and grew to admire Henry Whipple. Like many of his congregants, they embraced his exuberance for making God's compassion real. They counted Henry Whipple as a true friend. Hundreds of miles from Whipple's Hall, Episcopalians in the newly formed state of Minnesota came together to elect the state's first Episcopal bishop. The St. Paulites were bitterly divided between two candidates. After multiple rounds of voting, it was clear that neither would win. After one of the ballots, the convention picked up on an odd pattern. One voter kept voting for a guy that wasn't even in the running, Henry B. Whipple. Who was this guy? Who submitted his name? The voter spoke up. He had been trying to avoid the division. He'd recently traveled through Chicago, and one of his friends was raving about an obscure 37-year-old pastor named Henry Whipple. Exhausted, the Episcopalians elected Henry Whipple, a man they had never heard of, to be the state's first bishop. In June 1859, I one day returned home from visiting my parish and found my dear friend walking up and down in front of my house. He ran toward me, throwing his arms around my neck and exclaimed, my dear brother, you've been elected bishop of Minnesota. I cannot attempt to describe my feelings at this amount. Ready to take on the massive responsibility, Whipple left Chicago behind for the work that would define his life and his legacy.
In the winter of 1869, Bishop Henry Whipple was sick with bronchitis and aged beyond his years. His doctors had encouraged him to recuperate on the coast in southern France. By the seaside, the weak bishop nursed his ill health. He wrestled with grief. His decade in Minnesota had been marked by tragedy, by mistakes and horrible consequences, guilt. He rested and looked at the ocean. By extraordinary chance, he met another exhausted American, Augusta Shumway, whom Whipple remembered from his busy days in Chicago. She was traveling through Europe. They reunited on the coast of France. Augusta had lived with her own grief in the past decade. In the years since parting with Whipple, Augusta buried her two daughters and her husband. 12-year-old Clarina was the only other surviving member of the household. Whipple and Augusta were both dealing with grief. They were both thinking about legacy. Horatio had left Augusta tens of thousands of dollars worth of real estate. Whipple was a pillar of his community, nurturing a system of schools that educated generations of students. There, overlooking the sea, Augusta promised Whipple that she would donate to his school in honor of her past daughters. The Great Chicago Fire broke out a few years later devastating more than 2,000 acres of the city and more than 15,000 buildings. In the destruction, Augusta's real estate holdings were destroyed just as funding for the chapel was needed. To her relief, she collected enough insurance money to fully fund the construction of her promised building, the Eunice Shumway Memorial Chapel of the Good Shepherd, named in honor of her second daughter. Twenty-five years ago, I was elected your bishop. I can never forget the searchings of my heart when I received the titles. During the fall and winter, I visited every parish and mission in the diocese and selected Faribault as a residence because its citizens offered me a home. This choice seemed providential. These were the happiest days of my episcopate. July 16, 1862, I laid the cornerstone of the Cathedral of our Merciful Savior. The following day, I laid the cornerstone of our first Seabury Hall on the grounds of Shattuck School. In the fall of 1863, Seabury Hall was finished, and the Divinity School and its preparatory department were in this building. In 1865, we organized Shattuck School. In 1883, we finished our new St. Mary's Hall. As I look back on this history, I do not know how to express my gratitude to God and to the loving souls who, for 25 years, have stayed up my hands and cheered my heart. The Lord reward them in that day. I must not forget to tell you how faithfully the citizens of Faribault have fulfilled the pledge which they made at my first visit. They have always exhibited an honest pride in these schools and have always been ready for the willing hands and hearts to aid me in this work. There is an unwritten history of faith and love and rot in every building erected here. We made the plan. We laid the cornerstone with prayer and then worked and waited until the building was finished. In the small southern Minnesota town of Faribault, Whipple built the center of his diocese. Whipple was a moral leader for the town and for his premier project, the Bishop Seabury Mission. The boys' school, Shattuck, and the girls' school, St. Mary's, were firmly established by 1884, when Whipple celebrated the 25th anniversary of his consecration as Minnesota's first bishop. On this anniversary, Bishop Whipple found himself in a state of reflection. He was thinking back on the important days and persons of his life. A few months later, someone from his past appeared in the Faribault press. Augusta Huntington, formerly Augusta Shumway, passed away in 1884. One of her final gifts to Whipple, the new Shumway Hall, would be a permanent memorial to her first husband from her early days in Chicago, Horatio Shumway. The other, Johnston Hall, would be a memorial to her father, William Johnston. Headmaster George Tanner summarized the importance of Augusta's gift like this. 
Nothing could have been more opportune, he said. Quote, it solidified and expanded all that had been done and stirred the school on a new era of prosperity and of larger usefulness, end quote. Construction on Johnston Hall finished in 1888. Augusta's daughter, Clarina, laid the cornerstone on May 15, 1888, cementing her mother's legacy. Just one day later, she began her own family, marrying a man named Charles Hanks. It had been 31 years since she was born amidst the raising of Chicago, 30 years since her parents met and bonded with Henry Whipple, 17 years since her city was raised by fiery inferno, and four years since her mother passed away. For Clarina, the May of 1888 must have felt like a turning point, defining the legacy of her mother, her final family member to lay to rest, and beginning the next chapter of her life through her marriage. Laying the cornerstone of Johnston Hall, in many ways, was a monumental turning of the page for Clarina Shumway. Johnston Hall was an incredible building. An exemplar of the Romanesque style, it featured an 80-foot bell tower, and its beauty made it one of the great examples of Romanesque architecture well into the 21st century. It was not one stone or timber which made Johnston Hall a thing of beauty. A building is not a lie. It does not experience joy, nor pain, nor accomplishment, nor death. As the one nail is to the building, as the one spoke is to the wheel, so each soul passing through a building is a part of its memory, its identity, and its legacy. The story of a building is not that of brick and mortar, but of the lives for which it was shelter, a library, a classroom, a dormitory. For good or for ill, the lives which began, ended, and became enriched in Johnston Hall affected thousands of others. And so the building's legacy is not its roof and walls and silhouette. Its legacy is the lives of those the building imprinted upon, the lives which carried the memory of its ringing bells and book-filled shelves, all the lives changed by what was learned, what was healed, and what was experienced here. For our purposes, let's explore one life. One life indelibly impacted by time spent in Johnston Hall. Keeping in mind that as we do this, that every life that ventured beyond these walls was just as rich, just as sorrowful and joyful, and just as wide-reaching for every incalculable individual who once laid their eyes upon or tread the stones of Johnston Hall. But first, a reminder of where we came from, or rather, where another life came from. At the first service which I held in Faribault, I, I saw sitting on the chancel steps a bright-eyed Sioux boy of the ten years of age, with painted face and a blanket and a feather in his hair. He listened attentively and seemed much touched by the music, and afterward was always present at the services. I became so deeply interested in that boy that I educated him and baptized him. George Whipple, St. Clair. The Dakota people living in Faribault upon Whipple's arrival developed a trusting relationship with the young bishop. The St. Clair family arrived in 1859, the same year as Whipple, and lived in Faribault at various times across the tumultuous 19th century. The St. Clairs were immediate relatives to Teope and Good Thunder, two Dakota leaders and close personal friends of Bishop Whipple. They were also related to the Faribault family. Around the time that Whipple was catching up with Augusta in France, following the unexpected death of Teope, the St. Clair family moved from Faribault. George, now a young man, welcomed his first child on July 30th, 1870. His Dakota name was Akichita Chistina, translated to be Little Soldier. When he was baptized in the Episcopalian Church, he was also given the name Henry Whipple St. Clair, in honor of the bishop who protected and served their family. Henry St. Clair shared the interests of many children growing up in Faribault. His family likely lived along the Strait River in the area of today's Teepee Tonka Park. He was known to enjoy fishing and hunting. He joined his family for wild rice harvests. He would have learned the customs and familial obligations of being a Dakota man, and he likely attended church services led by Bishop Whipple, the man who so enthralled his father 
when he was a child. Henry loved tapping trees and making maple sugar and was known to share the yield with his namesake, Bishop Henry Whipple. When Henry was around 10 years old, George studied to be a clergyman. Under the tutelage of Bishop Whipple, he was ordained on June 17, 1879. Immediately, he was hard at work ministering to his Dakota relatives across Minnesota. He was the first Dakota man ordained in the Episcopal Church. As he showed more and more that the Savior's love had fallen upon him, I put him in our divinity school. He was the first Sioux whom I ordained to the sacred ministry. After some years of faithful labor among his people, he went to his rest. In 1880, tragedy struck when one of George's daughters passed away. The following year, he fell ill to tuberculosis. Fearing the worst, family from across the state met in Faribault. George summoned young Henry to his bedside. He held the hand of his 10-year-old son and said, Henry, I'm going away, and this time I won't come back. If you are a good boy, someday we will meet again. Will you be a good boy? The day of his burial, four of our Chippewa deacons, who were in Faribault, asked to be his pallbearers. It moved me deeply, for I knew that the father of two of these men was killed by the Sioux in a battle in which the father of Reverend George St. Clair had also been engaged. An illustration of the truth of our motto, Pax per sanguinum crucis. Peace through the blood of the cross. Perhaps that was felt among the burial party. For the St. Clair family, it was a time of brutal grief. Henry, his mother, and his siblings lived with relatives in Mendota for a year and then returned to Faribault. In that time, another relative, Alexander Faribault, passed away in destitution. A bright light emerged in this time of shadow, emitting from another of Bishop Whipple's schools. A friend of the St. Clair family offered to pay tuition for Henry to attend Shattuck School, a prep school in Faribault trying to earn its nickname, the Eton of the West. In 1883, Henry St. Clair attended the academically rigorous school. His mother was overjoyed. Henry was proud of his fancy school uniform. Henry was one of very few indigenous students at Shattuck, a fact he was never allowed to forget. Frequently, he found himself in scraps with his classmates. Teachers gave punishments disproportionately to Henry. He would come home, present to his mother his torn uniform, sometimes bloody and bruised. In the face of this, Henry's mother always mended the uniform, and Henry always returned to class the next day. He would spend his downtime socializing with students at the nearby Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf, rather than stay in the company of his own classmates. At the same time, there were major changes taking place for Henry's family. In 1888, land was purchased for the settlement of Dakota people at Birch Coulee, the site of one of the bloodiest battles in the 1862 U.S.-Dakota War. Nearly all of Henry's remaining family in Faribault sold what land they had and moved to Birch Coulee. In 1887, at 17 years old, Henry completed his studies at Shattuck. On one visit to his family at Birch Coulee, he met Almeida Jones. They soon became smitten, and with the approval of their families, married on November 2nd, 1889. The ceremony was held at the Church of St. Gethsemane in Minneapolis. It was one of the sites served by his father George in the ministry. Meanwhile, the Bishop of Minnesota was hard at work on the creation of Shattuck's Chapel and Johnston Hall. In the midst of these major projects, he was contacted by an old friend who was now living in Birch Coulee. Good Thunder gave me 20 acres of his land for the mission at Birch Coulee. He then came to me and said, I cannot live without a tipi wakan, or a sacred house. And if you build one, I will give you land. Well, I told him that I cannot allow him to give me his land. And finally, after several visits, he said to me with great earnestness, I do not give the land to you. 
I give it to the Great Spirit. Well, after that, there was only but one thing to do. The church at Birch Coulee was the project of Good Thunder, the first adult Dakota man who Whipple saw embrace the Episcopal Church. The new church was built from the stone of an old church near the defunct Indian Agency. The work was completed in 1891, one year after Whipple's wife, Cornelia, died in a train accident. At the lane of the cornerstone of this church, Good Thunder brought me a paper signed by the Indians, which read, you are to lay the first stone of a teepee wakan today. We ask you, Father, to name it after one we love so well, St. Cornelia. The Church of St. Cornelia was not the only tribute to the bishop's late wife. In 1895, Henry and Almeida St. Clair named their third daughter Cornelia. They would later name another child Henry Whipple and another Evangeline after Whipple's second wife. Indeed, the lives of the families living at Birch Coulee were entirely intertwined with the work and legacy of Bishop Whipple. Around the time that Cornelia St. Clair was born, Henry St. Clair felt called to follow in his father's footsteps and study to be a minister. His mentor Whipple cautioned him, for the work was laborious. But when he shook the bishop's hand, all doubt left Henry that this was the path he was destined for. In September 1895, he began studying at Seabury Divinity School which now included the libraries and classrooms of Johnston Hall. When Tay Mesa heard that her grandson, Henry St. Clair, was to enter the ministry, she exclaimed with tears of joy, this is the best thing that has come to me. My son's boy is to give his life to his people and will lead them to the Great Spirit. I shall die in peace. Henry found the work thrust upon him a great deal of solitude. It was every man for himself. No one cared to help me out. I learned that wherever an Indian goes, there's prejudice. In the lonely libraries and classrooms at Johnston Hall, Henry labored and bore his soul deeply into his studies. Perhaps reminded of his boyhood years at Shattuck, Henry pushed through and was ordained deacon on June 25th 1899, nearly two decades to the day after his father. Henry Whipple St. Clair, I have recently ordained. The ordination service took place in the Pretty Stone Church at the Birch Coulee Mission, which the Indian women long before sunrise had made beautiful by the flowers of the prairie, which have no rival. A blessed service never gladdened a bishop's heart, for as I cradled this dear son in my arms, at holy baptism, so I have carried him in my heart all these years. I confirmed him. Then he was catechist at this mission, and he is now at the Seabury Divinity School. Like his father, he counts it joy to tell the men of the love of Christ, and is full of the desire to work for his people, who hold him in deep affection and respect. Whipple assigned Henry to serve at the Birch Coulee Mission, surrounded by his family. While serving as deacon, a difficult year settled on the Birch Coulee community. In 1901, Good Thunder passed away. And in September of that year, so did Bishop Whipple. As a display of their relationship, Henry was a pallbearer. The procession trailed across Faribault, by Johnston Hall in the shadow of the bell tower, across the river that had come to define his life, shrouded in song as Dakota language hymns laid him to rest. Three years later, Henry St. Clair was ordained minister. In all my sermons, I always squeeze in the word love. You make a sandwich and put a slice of ham so thin in it that you can't even taste it. And yet there it is. That is what I do when I preach God's word and I try to squeeze in the word love. I try to keep it simple. A lot of men want to show how learned they are and use all these big words. No one could understand them. That doesn't go. We are all like children. In spite of his achievements and the respect he garnered from the most important men in the Episcopal Church, 
Henry still struggled in the face of both active and passive white supremacy, including from his fellow ministers. Ministers, churchmen, clergymen, bishops, or anyone who comes to these meetings are all supposed to be good, true Christians who are working for God. They should act like it and have brotherly love for everyone, for anyone. In time, he served in many capacities. At the Sisseton Reservation in 1917, as chaplain at Camp Cody in New Mexico during World War I, and when the world was rocked by the influenza epidemic of 1918. His duties required him at times to bury the dead himself, while still serving as many in his community as possible. They died by the hundreds. I buried as many as I could. I would walk from one end of the reservation to the other, day and night, but never caught the disease. As he got older, rheumatism affected him badly, making even simple tasks painful. In the late 1920s, he returned to Birch Cooley, but was not reappointed to serve in an official capacity. He did remain active in his community, however, conducting the occasional baptism, wedding, and funeral. Henry Whipple St. Clair died on December 30th, 1958, at the age of 88. He was beloved by the community he served and remembered by the thousands of people he loved to help. At the time of Henry St. Clair's death, Johnston Hall, where he had studied to help those countless thousands, was in a moment of great change. But it wasn't its first moment of metamorphosis. In 1933, the Seabury Divinity School left Faribault after merging with other Episcopal schools in Illinois. Johnston Hall was left adrift. The building's next major occupant came in 1947, when the St. Lucas Nursing School moved in. Since 1909, the Deaconess General Hospital was Faribault's only acute general hospital. In 1920, they offered an accredited diploma program for registered nurses. Hundreds of nurses and generations of patients were served by their program, which was partially run out of Johnston Hall. However, by 1950, the St. Lucas Deaconess Hospital was obsolete. Faribault needed a modern hospital. St. Lucas teamed up with other local organizations and sought public funding for a new general hospital. They put the issue to the voters of Rice County, who voted down the bond issue to fund such a project in 1952 and again in 1954. The State Health Board threatened to condemn the only hospital facility in Faribault. It was a desperate situation. At this time, the team successfully pitched a district hospital model. In the 1955 election, the voters approved funding for a hospital that would serve most of Rice County. In 1957, St. Lucas sold the Johnston Hall property to District 1 Hospital for a little under $40,000. District 1 Hospital opened in May of 1960. Johnston Hall shared a campus with the new construction. A month prior, St. Lucas Hospital closed and transitioned their facilities to long-term care. The story of healthcare in Faribault would be centered squarely on District 1, in the shadow of Johnston Hall. That same year, a new resident moved in, the Faribault Area Vocational and Technical Institute. From theology to healthcare, and now to skilled trades, the next chapter of Enlightenment entered Johnston Hall. In the 1970s, the District 1 facilities continued to expand, and Johnston Hall was added to the National Register of Historic Places. In 1984, the trajectory of Johnston Hall's use was irrevocably altered when the Minnesota Department of Education deemed the building unsafe to such an extent that they vacated the vocational school from the premises. No longer fit for educational use, clearly the stone structure was showing its age, and it was a challenge finding someone up to the task of maintaining it. At first, things seemed promising. A group of healthcare providers were in negotiation to purchase Johnston Hall and rehabilitate it as a healthcare campus. The building would transfer ownership, and the city of Faribault approved public funding to allay the costs of improving the iconic historic structure. At the last moment, after the city council had approved the funds, the buyers dropped out. The following year, 
a group of citizens established the Save the Johnston Hall Committee. In 1987, District 1 sold the building. Modest improvements were made to maintain it. For the next nine years, it was essentially used like a commercial building. Private healthcare practices and other businesses worked out of the Gothic structure. Then in 2008, District 1 bought back the building for $425,000. Johnston Hall resumed its healthcare and administrative uses. The building was still in famously rough shape, such rough shape in fact, that the Preservation Alliance of Minnesota awarded the building a grant for, and I quote, most endangered building in Minnesota. An additional grant from the Minnesota Historical Society was deemed insufficient to preserve the building. In 2012, District 1 announced their intention to demolish it. Over the next nine years, Johnston Hall was in limbo and vacant. The Save the Johnston Hall Committee filed an injunction and used public pressure to delay the demolition in the hopes of finding a developer. District 1 routinely sought developers to no avail. Another layer of complexity was added when District 1 sold its assets, liabilities, and operations to Alina Health in 2015. Finally, 34 years after it was initially announced, Johnston Hall was demolished in 2021. Efforts from the Save the Johnston Hall Committee and the Rice County Historical Society salvaged artifacts, a time capsule, and as many memories of the building as possible prior to its demolition. Johnson Hall's story did not begin with its construction in 1888, nor did it end with its demolition in 2021. For 133 years, Johnson Hall held the stories of those who passed through it. But every student studying in the library, every nurse learning a new vocation, every young child getting a new cast, brought their stories into the building and carried Johnson Hall's stories into their own.